Right, we have got an exceptional, I said I wouldn't big her up, an exceptional speaker. And I'm really, really delighted um, to introduce Ellie, who has uh, a huge amount of experience, uh, is a very experienced um, uh, nurse and um, with, with pouches, in particular, uh, running the biofeedback department at St Mark's Hospital uh, until uh, up until recently. She's continuing great work, but she's continuing it, let me get this right, at the Princess Grace Hospital um, in London and also doing all sorts of other things. But we've, we've um, Ellie's been a great um, supporter of Redline Group and indeed some may remember that she's uh, addressed us at a couple of uh, information uh, days obviously we're all, we're all, we're all virtual time being but um, they've been great talks very informative and um, it, it's, it's really fantastic the work she does I have to say it, it's fantastic and so I'm really looking forward tonight a very provocative title uh, Crouch for your pouch uh, which gets a little hint um, but I, I'm really really pleased to introduce Ellie Bradshaw. Ellie. Thank you very much for inviting me up been a um, strong supporter of yours for many years since um, I first came to St Mark's actually as a stoma care nurse which was uh, 15 odd years ago so I'm very very happy to be invited and very happy to be involved and I've just seen some bunting up in my window which I hope doesn't distract you so um, hashtag crouch for your pouch because it's all about the hashtag nowadays so I felt that I needed to, to up my game when it came to giving these talks. So I'm gonna be talking specifically about um, pelvic floor in relation to pouch emptying, um, and also looking at the Delphi study, some major research that's just come out, which I just think is so interesting, probably what, the biggest study that's actually had patient involvement, looking at pouches, um, pouch symptoms and pouch function overall. Okay, Gary, let's get started. So as you know, and many of you know um, from your various researchers and your experience, um, essentially the, the pouch procedure was first described 40 years ago, and it was a way of avoiding a permanent ileostomy for many. However, it wasn't without its certainly early complications. And what we now know to be um, the sort of downsides of having an internal anal pouch. So although we avoid permanent ostomy, pouches are not always perfect. We know um, now we prefer the J pouch in terms of formation to the other types of pouches. They've come in and gone out of fashion and your surgeon obviously will, will tell you about their preferences and their experiences of the different types of pouches. Generally done in either two or three stages, you know what it entails, it's basically removal of the colon and the rectum. And that has, in terms of stool form, big connotations because you've lost what would have been your natural reservoir. And also that the organ really, the colon that removes the majority of fluid from the stool. So that's why pouch output, as we all know, is looser and pouch emptying is more frequent than if you had the colon and rectum in situ. Okay, Gary. Okay, so you might be asking yourself what biofeedback is and um, why this applies to specifically to pouch patients, I think. Um, and it's, it's behavioral therapy, not in terms of addressing, you know, sort of adaptive behaviors or anything like that, but it's optimizing your behaviors actually and your pouch behaviors in terms of getting the best out of your pouch function. So it's actually used for a variety of things. So I've done, I've used uh, biofeedback for low anterior resection syndrome, which is something with rectal removal where you actually have um, a similar um, sequela of symptoms that you can see as a result of rectal reservoir removal in the same way that you see it in pouch patients. But it's a way of optimizing things in terms of how you take your medication, when you take your medication, what dietary measures you can use, so dietary modification or exclusion. Um, so it's not so much your behaviours per se, it's probably more applicable to the behaviour of your pouch and what you can do to positively impact on the behaviour of your pouch. So it's in its broadest sense biofeedback when we use it as we have at St Mark's where it was first um, basically formulated 30 odd years ago is 
biofeedback was termed bowel and muscle retraining. And that specifically pertains to the pelvic floor muscles. So the hammock of muscles in the male and the female that runs holding everything in the pelvis and allowing us to empty completely. And actually, if you have a pelvic floor dysfunction prior to a pouch, i.e. you've had an obstetric trauma or you've had other surgery down below, it can compromise your pouch function. So think of it in terms not just of the pouch itself, but also the supporting structures, the muscles on the underside that allow you to push against your own pelvic floor in order to be able to empty completely. It, of course, it's not just empty completely, it's also continence. So how good is the sphincter? And you often find that patients who've had previous trauma or surgery to the anal sphincter are worse off in terms of continence, because if you think you've got a liquid stool, high pressure, high velocity sitting on top of a sphincter, which is not optimal, that is the circumferential muscle at the bottom, you can be in trouble in terms of leakage purely because the stool is very loose in the first instance, but secondly, because obviously the nerves that were there originally are not there. So that's why quite often there's a, certainly with new pouches, there's a bit of a, a period of getting used to it and adjusting it to it, just sensation. So in terms of neurologically, how you sense, am I full, am I complete? Do I still need to go? Getting off the toilet, oh God, I've got to go back, you know, this type of thing. So biofeedback basically is probably the world's most harmless thing that a healthcare professional can do to you because it is completely non-invasive. The most you would ever get from me in a clinic is the finger examination. So that's really as, as intrusive as it gets. And that's why it's widely tolerated by patients, extremely well received because it doesn't involve somebody necessarily sticking anything into you for protracted periods or poking you or having any special preparation and actually the nice guidance says biofeedback and sort of conservative management is definitely the way forward in terms of continence IBS and even evacuation disorders so the ability to be able to empty completely because it is so non-invasive doesn't involve any surgery or any permanent effects it's just a way of optimizing the function of your pouch. Next, I've just tried to move the slide. <laughs> Gary, I'm reliant on you. Right, so what does it involve? So if you were having some symptoms, you were coming to talk to me, what we do is we talk in great detail, probably for usually um, up to an hour. And we talk about the specificity of the symptoms. So we talk about the most bothersome symptoms for you and try to get some sort of feel for the best way to manage them which fits in with your lifestyle because obviously it's not always appropriate to you know completely exclude all fiber from your diet it's not always appropriate to take 20 emodium a day you know it's not always appropriate to have a pouch that functions five or six times overnight you know so we look in terms of advanced assessment at holistic needs so we look at your specific lifestyle and how we can optimize things for you Patient education, quite frankly, for people that attend this group, I wouldn't have to do a lot of education. There's not a lot that, that I, you know, I can tell you um, really in terms of things like anatomy and physiology and the emergent research because you will have done that yourself. So you're well informed, you keep up to date and you have really, really key contacts in finding out more. Bowel and muscle retraining, again, same sort of thing, looking at the optimization of emptying and the optimization of continence in terms of the muscle. So making sure that your pelvic floor is not just a pelvic floor, it is an Olympian pelvic floor in terms of giving you something to push against and in terms of control. So that should you get profuse urgency, you can grip for long enough to get to facilities. We talk about very practical things in biofeedback and it's sort of, it's a way of supported self-management. So I don't tell people what to do per se. I give them a range of options. Okay, well, how about this? What fits in? How do you feel about this? You know, have you considered this? So it really is practical techniques to support patients to self-manage. I can't come home with you, but I can give you an hour of my time. Say, okay, well, let's try this and let's monitor it done it again sorry Gary <laughs> can you turn over Gary <laughs> turn over the slide right so you might be asking yourself well this sounds great but you know pouches you know we 
we know that there's a prevalence um, sometimes with, with pouch dysfunction and that pouches can be very unpredictable sometimes predictably unpredictable in that they will um, you know, catch you out when you least expect it. But actually the literature shows that a good, pou a good pouch function is related to aspects such as not going quite so often, emptying completely and feeling complete, which is really important because I think there's nothing more frustrating than not being able to go in, go in one go, clustering in and out the toilet, feeling that you finished standing up and thinking, I've got to go back. And also it's, it's really unpleasant to have a feeling like you're full. It's very distracting, it can put you off doing what you need to do. So of course, pouch dysfunction can be said to include increased frequency of pouch emptying, evacuatory problems and fecal or mucus incontinence or leakage. So essentially talking about the props, which was the pat patient reported outcome for pouch patients, which was the biggest study where there's ever actually been patient involvement. So the Delphi study, which was published in July of this year, looked at 195 pa pouch patients. And what they did was they sent them all questionnaires to ask them, okay, what are your major problems? And what are the consequences of these problems? And essentially, as one would imagine, the problems were fecal incontinence, soiling. So soiling is more or less after you've been or on the way to the toilet, you get perineal soiling. So a little bit of grittiness around the tail end, very sore, very irritating, can lead to a lot of excoriation and it itches like hell. And one of the major problems with, with skin care when it comes to patches is that people forget that the skin goes into the anus. So it doesn't just go buttocks, skin, 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 bow. The skin goes in to about two to three centimeters. And that's really important if you consider your stool's really liquid, you go, you might have some residue from very, very loose stool and then it's going to rub and it's very uncomfortable. So that was another of the symptoms which they were like, what a massive surprise. People have found perianal symptoms very uncomfortable. Well, of course they would because their skin you know, if you don't empty completely in particular or have a problem with continence, your skin's going to get extremely excoriated from very loose stool, which is very acidic. Clustering and fragmentation. So that's what I was talking about. In and out the toilet, not feeling complete of evacuation. F frequency, urgency. Of course, you're going to go more because you have a pouch. You have no colon to be able to absorb the additional water and you don't have the same reservoir capacity. So we can expect up to 10 times in 24 hours, I believe is still the gold standard. I know people that are satisfied with a pouch that empties more, and some people are absolutely not satisfied and will train their pouch to enable them only to go three or four times a day. And that is possible because like all gut, it has plasticity. So you can actually train it to some extent. There are exceptions. You can train it to hold a bit more because very much like the stomach and all the gastrointestinal system, it has huge stretching capacity. So um, they looked also at nocturnal symptoms. So the, De the Delphi report showed that there was quite a lot of nocturnal leakage overnight. So, and that kind of makes sense if you think you've got a high pressure sack with very loose stool behind a sphincter. When you're asleep, your sphincter will always relax slightly. And if stool's very loose, particularly if you haven't emptied completely, you can just have soiling or staining, or even larger scale accidents overnight. When they looked at the consequences of what this actually mean, means for pouch patients, they looked at the need for continence supply. So wearing a pad, wearing a liner, wearing an anal plug. They looked at toilet awareness. So toilet awareness is, as one would imagine, having to know where the toilets are. And that's of course not uncommon. If you have to go in a rush, you will know where the toilet. You may plan your day or your routes around where the toilets are in case I need to go. Um, people in the study found that dietary and medical adjustments were really, really troubling in terms of the fact there were certain things they just couldn't eat or they had to make certain modifications or exclusions to be able to allow the pouch not to be a problem. There was alterations in sleep and energy levels, I think, related to to the symptom of nocturnal disturbance. So having to empty your pouch or being afraid of incontinence or actually having incontinence overnight, obviously will tie you out, understandably so. 
Impact on quality of life, or goes without saying, impact on social roles and social functioning is extremely common. Um, and also the, the negative impact of all of the above, if it's massive change in not just body image, but in, in functioning on all levels. So pouch frequency, you might be wondering to yourself, is there anything I haven't tried for pouch frequency? So the pharmacotherapy route is obviously loperamide, which everybody knows about. But codeine is also extremely good at night, particularly if you get leakage or frequency, knocking back a bit of codeine, um, not something that all of us can take in the day. Um, it depends how you tolerate it. But remember, because your transit is quicker, it's not necessarily in your system for that long. So actually taking something like codeine at night, just allow the bowel to relax and sleep. And that can seriously reduce nocturnal symptoms. So leakage as well as frequency. Cholestyramine is a bile acid sequestrant. And the good thing about bile acid sequestrants is they soak up bile. So like a big sponge, they suck everything up and they can make your pouch output, if it's completely watery, have more form. And if you've got more form, you've got more warning, you've got more ability to grip. So skin protectants. Barrier creams, I really like hydromol. Hydromol is a water-based emollient. Um, Diltizum, that's if you get a fissure. So anybody that's ever had a lot of frequency will know you can split the skin of the anus. And that's what I was talking about there. The skin goes into the anus. So it's essentially having a paper cut right up your backside. It's a non-sinister but completely debilitating problem. Anal fissures are excruciating but particularly if you've got very liquid stools and you've got frequency every time you go to the loo you're gonna have acid pouring over a paper cut so diltiazem is the best way in my opinion of getting rid of fissures but i would say although it says don't put it into the anus i would say that quite often um fissures actually are on the inside so i think you know try and get a little bit of cream up into the anus and that will quite often protect the skin. Lignocaine, some patients find this really useful. That's a way of obviously numbing down the area if you have acute pain on defecation. But I would always look to see whether or not you've got, you've actually got fissure. Um, because if it's a fissure, it'll do better with something like diltiazem. And they used to use GTN, but thank God we've moved away from that because obviously GTN can give you absolutely horrific headaches um, and make you feel really quite unwell because it's a vasodilator, so it makes everything go or your vessels open up. Great for healing, not great for other side effects. Migraine and feeling very unwell and dropping your blood pressure being a few of them. So dietary advice modifications. So I, I, I've actually been in a good position because I've actually learned to have to give advice on the FODMAP diet, which is quite possibly the world's most depressing diet. But the idea of the FODMAP diet is usually that you exclude oligosaccharides, the fermentable foods, and then what you do is you slowly introduce them back in in order to spot triggers. Say, for example, you take a certain subgroup of fermentable sugars, you exclude them, well, you exclude everything to start with, and then you introduce them back in and then wait three days and see whether or not the symptoms are any better. Um, exclusion diets, I think a lot of my patients, and this is regardless of whether or not they've had surgery or they're actually even in continuity, have massive problems um, with tolerating certain foods. You know, you see it in IBS all the time, certainly lactose. A lot of people don't, we haven't evolved necessarily to get on that well with lactose. We haven't necessarily evolved that well to get on well with gluten. And that's not unusual. In fact, that's one of the main things. Um, <clears throat> certainly if you get other sort of symptoms from it, you know, like feeling a bit sick when you have milk, try excluding lactose, you know, just other general abdominal symptoms. That's not too complicated nowadays. It used to be 20 years ago to say to somebody avoid gluten because there was like no gluten-free foods. <clears throat> but I think we are becoming more aware and actually gluten-free products are slightly less disgusting than they used to be. Okay, Gary. Pouch training. So I was talking there, wasn't I, about my... Gary. Gary, you got really excited there, didn't you? Yes. I could sense, I could sense your excitement. I don't know how many so points on these slides, that's the problem. Oh. I, well, you say that, Gary, but I like to think you've just got a bit overexcited. Okay. So, urge deferral. So, I did meet a man, and he was a very determined man, and I've met a few very determined people throughout the course of my career, and he got his pouch down to emptying three times per day, and he did this purely 
with the power of his mind. Now, this is not this is not for everybody and this is not possible for everybody. But he somehow and he did it without medication, which is just unbelievable. But it, it was just the way his body was. But this, he was able to empty his pouch, go into work. He was so otherwise engaged that he was able to defer the urge. So he just wasn't listening to the signals. And I'm sure it was going, let me out. But he was able to just completely ignore the signals and got it down to, and, and I thought he's going to have frequency of the night. This is what's going to happen, but he didn't. So it just goes to show that you can actually, if you know your sphincters are good and you've got a little bit of form in your stool, it's not totally liquid, you can actually put it off going. And the way that we teach, it's not rocket science, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we just say, right, if you're in the house, and you feel like you need to go, see if you can put off going for five minutes. And quite often, although this still doesn't go away as it does in the rectum and the colon, but quite often the urge will dissipate if you're being quiet still and your brain is engaged elsewhere. The, the urgency will often dissipate. And to an extent that will increase your capacity and also your self-belief. Because quite often, certainly when you've just had a pouch made and you, you know, you're going 40 times a day, your skin is sore and you're incontinent, you don't believe that you can hold. But actually, with time, as things accommodate more and you become more aware of signals, actually, you, your ability quite often outweighs your confidence in terms of the fact that quite often you can grip for longer than you realise. But if you've been incontinent, it's very difficult, you know, to resist the urge. But we start at home. So we say, start at home, okay? Just say, no, I'm not going now. I'm just going to finish what I'm doing you're at home so you can gauge it quite well and you know with confidence so understanding of consonants mechanisms <sighs> anuses just really amazing organs so you've got your internal anal sphincter which is the one that's governed by deep breath and then overlapping it you have your external anal sphincter now the internal anal sphincter you can't exercise on its own but for most people there's a bit of an overlap so if you tone up your external anal sphincter and your accessory muscles, so all the muscles that surround that circumferential muscle, you can improve your tone because like all muscles everywhere in the body, if you exercise them, they get bulkier and they get stronger and they have better tone. So sometimes, and this can happen with very low pelvic surgery, you can end up with a compromised sphincter. So either in terms of nerves, or it can actually be um, a damaged muscle. And that's why it's you know, really important that with any low pelvic surgery, you know, hopefully you make the most of your sphincter muscles because they are absolutely critical, certainly in terms of things like sampling. So sampling is the reflex whereby you think, is it safe to fart? Is that gas? Or is that not gas? And the sampling mechanism again, from the sphincter can be compromised by pouch surgery. So you can missample, we call it missampling. Um, insight into the brain bowel signals with visual biofeedback. So this is probably the most invasive thing I do. It's practically neurosurgery, considering that most of what I do is talking. But what we do is we take a small probe and we put it into the anus and it has a visual feedback me mechanism. So it's like a um, pressure sensor. So when you squeeze your sphincter, the line goes up, and then when you relax, it goes down. And you can actually teach somebody, reteach or retrain them what squeezing the sphincter should feel like. And this is really helpful in terms of teaching people to do exercises, because sometimes you're not quite sure what you're doing. You know, if somebody's been very low in your pelvis, actually the signals are slightly disrupted for a while. Your an anatomy is entirely different. So something like actual biofeedback using a machine which I use just a handheld thing and it's just got lights on it I mean there's various ones there's ones where you can play games you can jump through hoops um, there's all sorts of very clever but I literally just use a pressure sensor with lights on it and I found that to be extremely useful for patients but there's all you know pelvic floor physiotherapists will probably have something slightly more sophisticated okay Gary so evacuatory techniques. <laughs> Gary was telling me a story about this earlier, which I won't share with you. But humans are designed to empty their bowel squatting, and this makes complete evacuation anatomically and gravitationally easier. 
However, it doesn't always work for pouch patients because the pouch by way of where it sits can actually drop lower. So you can have, I'm going to use this, and my cat's nicked the cap of this bottle. So I can't show you. If you would imagine uh, you've got your sphincter and then you've got your pouch. If you have a rectum, it more or less goes straight, it's connected by ligaments. If you have a pouch, it can fall down behind the sphincter. So sometimes squatting will help to tip it forward to allow you to get more out. Sometimes you have to lean backwards because it depends on where everything sits in your pelvis on the thing. And sometimes you can use intra-abdominal pressure to empty. So quite simply, you can use your hands to support your abdomen, pushing in and pushing up and then leaning forward, which puts extra pressure there over where the pouch is and allows you to empty more completely. When it comes to the evacuation position, next slide, please, Gary. Oh, standing up, yeah, yeah. So, oh yeah, no. Don't worry about double voiding. I'm going to talk about double voiding in a minute, Gary. Right, so yeah, so that's one way to do it. So one way is to put your feet up and lean forward with your elbows on your knees, and then you make yourself as fat as possible and push down at the same time, and then you relax. You make yourself as fat as possible. So by pushing out your lower abdominal muscles and pushing down, what you create is this. So pushing through the pouch, relaxing the sphincter. But you can do the same thing using your hands. So you can just lift up in the area of the pouch, push against your own abdominal muscles to create pressure and then you should get more out. The other thing, the double void, which we use a lot in bladder patients, but it works with pouches, is actually to stand up for 10 seconds and sit back down, because what it does is this, so that you're more able to empty, certainly with liquid. That's why it works for bladders. Okay, Gary. Well, right, so irrigation to empty. So a, there are a couple of ways you can empty. So for example, if you're more likely to have a thicker output either because you use pharmacotherapy or that's just how you are you can use water irrigation so if you look on the right that's what we call the q4 um, go or the q4 mini and that's a way which is exactly what it looks like it's like an anal douche so you just literally fill up a bulb with warm water stick the cone on the top put it up the bum and squeeze it and it instills about 120 mils of warm water that will loosen off the output to allow you to empty more completely. And some patients use that after they've, so when they've emptied their pouch and they even if they feel empty, they use it after they've been just to get rid of any residual. It's particularly good if you get post defecation soiling. So that's where you have your pouch open. You walk around or, you, you know, particularly if you're going at pace, you, you go for a brisk walk and then you think, oh my God, I've had some leakage, you know. So this is a good way to make sure that there's no residual sitting very low down in your pouch, which is on the pressure of, putting pressure through your pelvis is not going to leak out through your sphincter. The Medina catheter, which is on the left, is again another way of emptying. So again, if your anatomy is slightly unusual and you can't empty your pouch, and quite often it's sensory and anatomical, you can actually just put in a Medina catheter and instill some water. So you just use um, a 50 ml syringe into the end of the Medina catheter and it just instills water and water is easier to empty, as we know, because we know how much easier it is to empty when things are looser and when things are harder. So they're both ways in which you can kind of make sure you're empty. And if they work for you, you can use them before you go out, you know, for example. So sometimes what I do with my patients is say, right, make sure you're as empty as possible. Take two loperamide, go for a curry or a night out, you know, because then you've got a few hours grace. So next slide, please, Gary. Pelvic floor and sphincter exercises. I know because you're all under the care of excellent pouch nurses that you will all have been doing your sphincter exercises from the day your stoma was formed, weren't you? Particularly you, Gary, 35 years ago, definitely doing your anal sphincter exercises. So as we said, the external anal sphincter overlaps the internal one. So exercising it will actually improve your overall tone. And the way that you do a sphincter exercise, and you've been famous for teaching this um, over the years, which I'm very proud to share with you, is that you imagine without engaging your buttocks, because your buttocks are not responsible for your continence, you squeeze your bum hole and lift it up like you're picking up a coin. So you squeeze your bum hole 
anus, anal sphincter, squeeze and pull it up like you're picking up a pound coin as deep inside as possible, holding it for five seconds. I haven't done my for ages. I'm relaxing for five seconds. And again, squeezing and pulling up, holding for five seconds. I'm relaxing for five seconds. There's a very good app called Squeezy. Squeezy is an NHS app, which is like 2 99 And it will text you throughout the day to remind you to do five sets of exercises. It times you as well, which is quite good because you imagine that five seconds is much shorter than it actually is when you're doing any exercise. So it's always a good way to, you know, confirm. Also, what it does is it notifies you at which point you'll turn off your notifications because it's just really getting on your nerves. But if you can get into a pattern with sphincter exercises, they're very behavioral. So um, when I was doing an awful lot of teaching, I would do them whilst walking along in pelvic floor exercises. I don't think I could do that now, but then I'm quite a lot fatter. So I think, you know, any pressure on the pelvis makes any pelvic floor exercise more difficult. So using exercise programs to promote strength, endurance and fast. So you do your five seconds. So overall, you build strength. The first thing you do, always build strength for muscle. Then you build endurance which is picking up your pound coin but only going halfway so you don't take it up to level 10 you take it up to level five and you hold it for twice as long 10 seconds and you can build up to 20 seconds and then the fast response fast response is what it sounds like squeeze relax squeeze relax squeeze relax and see many how many how many you could do without your muscle getting tired i can't do many <laughs> but that's that's a really good and that is the difference between making it to the toilet and not make it to the toilet because if you get an urge you squeeze up as quick as you can snap and you hold you will get to a toilet you will if that muscle is optimized your continence will be improved so pelvic floor exercises in general so not just sphincter but pelvic floor so uh, this is for all the muscles so remember it's a massive hammock of muscles it's not just about your bum hole you know even in men even men have a pelvic floor which they find very difficult to accept but you still have one. In fact, you have more than women. That's why you have less incontinence because you don't have an extra two holes. You've basically got a massive wadge of steak-like muscle right at the bottom. So essentially for a male pelvic floor exercise, you pick up your coin, as you are doing now, you can tell from your faces, and then you pull in under the base of your penis and you hold the whole lot up and you can feel it moving up like that. When you're a woman, it's much easier. You pick up two coins, one with the anus and one with the vagina, and you lift them and you hold them. And again, working on strength overall and relaxation and then endurance and then fast twitches. But you build up. You have to have strength before you move on to the other stages. It's very good leaflets and marks about this. Very good leaflets and marks. I think it's called, I didn't write it. I'd like to put this out sphincter exercises for those suffering from leakage of the bowel or something exceptionally wordy that doesn't sound very appealing but it does teach you the different exercises so essentially think about it it's a muscle you exercise it it will get stronger it will help it will prevent problems in the future and it's a booty bonus because let's face it it's continence it's emptying because you've got more to push against and it's sexual function as well so everyone's a winner aren't they really in that scenario you have a strong pelvic floor life is better right next one please gary okay so non-relaxing pelvic floor dysfunction is an underestimated complication of ileal pouch anal anastomosis um so one of the other problems just to just to really confuse you so one of the problems is instead of being weak you actually just don't relax so in order to be able to empty your bowel whether or not you have a rectum you have to be able to push and relax at the same time like that. and sometimes particularly if you've had a lot of soreness in the area if you've had fissures or pain it becomes very difficult to relax your bum hole because you have anticipatory anxiety about oh my god this is going to be really painful so your internal anal sphincter which is governed by your deep brain goes i'm not laying that out something really uncomfortable and that can actually exacerbate the situation because obviously you don't empty completely you're going to go more the more you go the more uncomfortable you're going to be particularly if you've got something like a fissure and actually anal sphincter dysfunction 
um, the non-relaxing anal sphincter is, is quite often known as anismus and anismus is failure to relax completely so and sometimes it kind of flaps about and you can feel it so sometimes when you examine people you can feel that their sphincter is flapping about on the top of your sphincter and you'll say that's what happens when you're on the loo it flaps about and that's why you go in you know kind of burst type thing and you don't you don't get empty so that's another thing that you can kind of address with conservative bowel management or biofeedback um, such as the stuff that I do, because you can counter that, believe it or not, without too much intervention, not too much poking. Firstly, you treat the underlying cause, but quite often it's a case of uh, relaxing the muscles down. And a pelvic floor physiotherapist that's worth their salt or um, biofeedback therapist will be able to help you teach you techniques to be able to do that. OK, Gary, I'm slightly concerned because I can't see a clock. How long have I been talking for? Uh, you've been talking for around about 33 minutes. I did tell really you good. that my major so, issue is just yeah. not shutting no, it's, up. It's really good. Um, um, hopefully everyone is doing it as much as I am. If no, we, no, if they're, we said, they're all asleep, David. <laughs> if we said another, say, eight to ten minutes, top. Yes, and then, I am going to wind it Because I'm sure up. there'll be lots of questions. I'm yeah. sorry. I just, no, 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 no don't, don't, don't apologize. It's it. great. It's really Sorry. terrific. We were late starting a little bit. So, uh, yeah, don't worry about it. Crack on. Right, prevention of leakage. So there's two main ways to prevent leakage, in my opinion. I do not accept pads. I refuse to accept pads. To me, pads are a sign of failure. I accept that they are necessary for some, but I, if a patient leaves my clinic after two to three months of treatment and they're wearing a pad, I feel awful. I think there's more modern ways of handling it nowadays. And most patients should respond to those. That's what I believe. That's my personal belief. So you can either have the good old left-hand side coloplast, very absorbent and very underrated peristine plug. Now that's bloody good, that. Okay, so it's hugely absorbent. Literally, sometimes I stick it in a bottle and then turn the bottle up to show patients that even when I shake the bottle, nothing comes out of it because it's so bloody absorbent. It creates a seal. So if you have any sphincter damage at all or any problems with your sphincter mechanism, it creates like an upside down umbrella. So it goes in like a Tampax, put it in. And then as it hits the fluid of the bowel, it goes like that, creates a complete umbrella, which obviously is a seal between your patch and the outside world. Um, we did do a study on the Renew insert. Um, so the Renew insert is much, much lighter. It's not absorbent, but it does create a, an artificial kind of internal anal sphincter kind of thing in that it creates a seal i quite like renew but for major like i'm going for a curry and i have passive leakage i would definitely be going for the the old-fashioned model the old coloplast plug because it's bloody absorbent yes david uh, ellie how do you get the first one out oh <laughs> you just pull it it's got a string on it it's an umbrella yeah, but it's soft. Okay. So it's it's like a hydrocolloid thing. So it's very, very absorbent. But when you pull the string, it, come, it Thank just, you. Yeah. So the Renew, though, I mean, we did do it. Well, I'm about to show you. We did a study on Renew, which was my idea. But John Siegel actually stole it. We were talking about pouches and nocturnal leakage. And it works. It works very well, particularly for nocturnal leakage. It's not bulky any less likely to be able to feel it. Okay, Gary. Where's my Gary? Okay, so this is what we did. And this was as a result of me talking to John Siegel over a cup of coffee. And I said, why don't you do something and renew? And at the time, I believe he was the pouch fellow. So what, what we talked about was that how a lot of pouch patients in our experience had nocturnal leakage. And it actually, they did really well with the renew. So it's very lightweight. It's technically, it's not flushable, but we know it's flushable. You're not really supposed to do it, but it means if you're out and about, no one's going to arrest you flushing it down a toilet. Just stick it in a waste paper bin. Again, tends to when you go when you empty your pouch, just fall into the toilet. So you won't want to use like ten a day. If you have persistent leakage throughout the day, you, you would need to think of something else because that's not going to be cost effective. But for nighttime leakage, you just get a little bit of grittiness, or you're worried about like wind incontinence overnight. It's really good. It's really good. So you can read that online. Okay, Gary. 
Okay, so apparently 25% of patients get it. And in a small study, it was only small numbers. I think it was only 10 to 15. Um, it's both acceptable and effective. And it's, it's got no safety concerns. So it will come flying out when you go to the loo. And actually, if you flush the toilet, it will disappear. Um, and lots, lot, you know, vast reduction in, in nighttime, sort of passive, what we call passive seepage. So we're not aware of it, essentially. Okay, go. Okay, so my key points are literature shows that a good pearl function is often related to aspects such as lower frequency of pouch emptying, ease of evacuation and fecal continence. And actually that's shown by the Delphi study and I would look, look up the props. So that stands for patient reported outcome on pouch function. Props Delphi study, July 2021. That's the biggest study we've seen with patient involvement. And it's really interesting. And I'm really delighted to see it because everything else, if you Google it, which I did this evening just to see whether I'd missed something like really massive that had been published, essentially it's the, the most recent thing. And um, certainly the best thing that we've seen, I think, with patient involvement as well as expert consensus. But nobody is more of an expert than a group of patients. There just isn't anybody. So I'm, I was very pleased to see the Delphi study. But if you look down the Google list of publications, you'll see it goes 2021 and then it just goes 2007. You know, <laughs> I think you might find John's study 2017. But, you know, there's, there really hasn't been a lot and certainly not in this depth or as rigorous in terms of collecting data from the people that know best. OK, so there's many different techniques and strategies. So don't be afraid to ask. Ask your pouch specialist nurse, ask the group, ask for my email. I'm very, very happy to help if you want me to help to answer questions or refer you to people in your locality if I can find someone. Um, and essentially don't, don't put up with things if you haven't explored all the treatment options. We know pouches aren't perfect, but we also know there's uh, an awful lot we can do to optimize things. Okay, I can see some questions, but they were there and now they've gone. <laughs> do you want to hit me with the questions david I've, I've i've got some questions first of all that was absolutely fantastic thank you really good really enjoyed that and uh christopher and gary always admonish me for um talking too much when other people want to ask questions and asking my questions so i'm not going to ask any questions except those that be uh, um tabled by others i promise uh, even though I, I want i want to ask lots of questions Very thank you christopher Rainbow. so patricia <laughs> so these are in no particular order, all right? So Patricia has asked, uh, renewal, does it irritate hemorrhoids? No, it's too light. So hemorrhoidal cushions, oh, you'll be sorry you asked, I'm telling you. Hemorrhoidal cushions create a, um, a kind of seal on the anus. So they're very important, um, but actually the shape of the renew bypasses them. So it goes up. And then out and it's so soft to be perfectly honest with you i can't see it would cause any damage thank you thank you very much mm. okay tom um has asked the recommended prescription of codeine for nighttime control um i would start with 15 milligrams and see how you fare so because of the virtue of the fact that everything goes through quicker even though things stay in your stomach relative amount of time your absorption is slightly different when you don't have when you're not in continuity so i'd start with 15 milligrams but don't be alarmed if it goes up you know incrementally to up to 120 um but don't don't start it in the day <laughs> but go up incrementally you can go up to 120 milligrams very safely okay I hope that's uh, answered the question, Tom. Uh, ben, don't worry, I, I can see you've got your hand up. I'll get to you once I've done this, uh, so keep it hot. Um, Michelle, uh, Michelle uses a catheter uh, and uh, says it works really well for her. Is it okay to use a catheter every time you went to? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, it certainly is. I have patients that intubate, as we call it intubating, um, several times a day, yeah, provided what, what you look for is pain. So if you notice any pain or feelings of pressure or obstruction, um, then obviously you need to go and have a little patchoscopy just to check you haven't scuffed anything. But generally a well lubricated 
um, Medina catheter is completely fine. Several times a day. Michelle's um, dialing in all the way from the US. This is Ooh. a truly global international field. Yeah, absolutely, Ellie. Thank you, yeah. Michelle. They're dialing in from all over the world for you. Uh, we've got a lot of, oh, they're all really complimentary comments. I won't do those just yet. Um, will uh, will the PowerPoint be available? The PowerPoint will be available. Oh, by email. Christopher's asked. Would you send us the? Have we got the, we've got the PowerPoint by email because Gaz has got it. Are you happy for us to circulate it, Elisa? Of course, yeah. Of course, I am. Thank you, Ali. Yeah, I will put it on the website so you'll be able to download it from there with the presentation. Yeah. 100%. Of course it is. Thanks, Ellie. Okay. Thank you very much. Ben, you're up. Thank you, Ellie. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Pleasure. I was actually lucky enough to be one of the patients involved in the props, uh, the props thing that you, uh, that oh, you you're referred to. Oh, you're famous! <laughs> Stephen, I've forgotten his name, Stephen Wexner, is it? Wexner, yeah. Yeah. Um, it was good. It was good. Um, my question is along the lines of this irrigation that everybody's talking about. I am, and I know you don't want to talk specifics and medical advice, so, so let's keep this broad. Um, so if you, so I, I'm not a Medina user, I'm a, um, like a, what you called a, a douche, an anal douche user. Yeah. Uh, and I have a great little contraption that, that I bought on Amazon and I recommend to anyone on that J Pouch Facebook group. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, sometimes I use it and I get like, excuse my graphicness, the most fabulous gush of, of success and context uh, and contents. Mm -hmm. Other times I use it and not a lot happens. So like the water, I certainly use a lot more than the 150 mil or the 50 mil that you mentioned earlier, but yep. sometimes everything comes out and it's fabulous. Other times it's not actually very productive despite stuff going in. Any, any views on, is that an anatomical thing that you, that you showed us where it might have like dropped down below the sphincter? Like why, it, why it, it, certainly, it certainly can be to do with the position of the pouch. But remember, there's an awful lot that affects the bowel that we can't control. So even pouches, you know, your hormones, exactly what you've eaten, how stressed you are, how relaxed your sphincter is, mm. the lunar cycle. You know, there's all sorts of things that impact on the bowel that we, we don't have complete control of stuff we don't even understand to do with neurogastric hormones and transmitters and all of this type of thing i, I would say that's just pouches and it's quite common i have a lot of patients okay. who say to me they they even like using a medina i don't understand why i do it the same time every day after i've eaten and there, there's an awful lot of of external factors that influence your emptying um so just okay. not to overthink it okay just continue to use it. It's very safe. I know what you mean. You mean nine ninety nine, don't you? Do you mean nine ninety nine? I use that no, like quite often. I mean, not no, even not the nine ninety. You've got. You haven't even got the nine ninety nine version. I'm impressed got with a you. A monster. <laughs> Ben's got a monster. So, <laughs> so yeah. So don't don't overthink it. Use it as you need to. It's very very safe. You know, it's not going to cause you any damage. If you notice resistance again, just reiterate resistance, sure. pressure, or pain, you would stop using it and seek medical assistance. But generally, a very safe way. And, and there's never a situation where you're forcing stool and fluid back up the small intestine. No, it's too powerful. So the peristalsis in it is so huge, you can't force it back up the other way. It's constantly contracting. So you wouldn't have you wouldn't have the strength. Okay. Mm. To be honest. That is a great question. Yeah, great question. It is a great question. Great question. Thanks, Ben. So uh, Linda asks, any tips on maintenance after dilation? I think that's dilatation, isn't it, please? Oh, um, that, see, that's any, yes, is a short answer to that. Um, but I don't want to be too specific um, because like you're not sitting in front of me and I haven't just examined you. Um, but essentially, to keep something patent, we sometimes give you a dilator to take home, which you just put in and turn two or three times a week. 
but I would you must refer to your clinician about that because they will know the width and exactly what you could use at home but quite often post dilatation I've given patients a Hagar dilator H-A-G-A-R to take home and you just put it in two or three times a week and turn it for a minute but you should be trained how to do that don't attempt to do that yourself speak to your clinician who did the dilatation or gastroenterologist or surgeon does that answer the question is that okay she's fallen asleep she's, <laughs> she's fallen <laughs> oh yeah she's still muted so i'm gonna say yeah oh yes thank you yeah um Right, that's the, that, that's the questions that have been tabled on chat. So, um, Ben, you've got your hand up still, but I'm assuming I've got, I've got one more if, if I'm question, not. Um, I've got one more if I'm yeah. not hogging. Um, Ellie, this sure. is this is one I'm that about I ask to hog big time. So get your chance. <laughs> this is one that I ask a lot, um, and a lot of different people. When I say a lot of different people, surgeons, gastros, pouch nurses, etc. The 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 sensation of urgent 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 gripping on for dear life and you know Janindra saying to me you could cut my finger off with that grip that's phenomenal um and then sitting on the loo and thinking ah oh, this is it and looking around and thinking what's going on nothing's coming out like that I get that quite a lot like what what is that I would recommend a defecating pouch gram to tell you exactly what that is okay so go and speak to Janindra, who I know very well. He's one of my one of my dear friends, and ask for a defecating pouchogram, which shows what happens when you're upright. So it's not the world's most glamorous test, guys. I'm going to put it out there. But what they do is obviously put in something radio opaque that shows up on a scan, and you push it out while you're on a pretend toilet, and it takes a series of X-rays. So that shows you where everything is anatomically. It shows you the position, the shape of the pouch, and what your sphincter does. So that would be the way to know for sure. Okay, fine. Defecating pouchogram. Fine, Pouch perfect. Gram. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Michelle. It isn't as bad, and it's a very good diagnostic mm. test. Mm. Uh, Devinda. Hi, all right. Uh, I have problems emptying, but only in the evenings. Uh, I find that. The last bit, I have to use a sit sits back, you know, the one with the bowl. That seems to work. That empties me. Is that because it's loosening the muscles, or is there something else I can do? Just I would say that that I would say that the reason that warmth mm -hmm. is relaxing the muscles to allow you more of a complete evacuation. So I would say that's probably, and I wouldn't, I shouldn't say this without examining you myself, but I would say the sound of that. So something that relaxes when it hits warmth yeah. Um, yeah. tends to be a tight muscle okay it might so, just be it just might mean that you're just more tense in the evening than you are in the day right. or it might just be the way that you are okay um i'm actually from wolverhampton i've got my surgeon's appointment on mondays anything i can ask her to check for me for that um i would get her to check your fit i mean she should be doing a papchoscopy anyway i'm sure but also to just get a digital rectal examination and get get her to feel the muscle because you can tell if somebody has a, a particularly tight muscle or spasming muscle and also yeah. to get you to squeeze and relax to see what that mechanism is like yeah um, she but did it, the, sorry she did the finger test she said that was fine mm, there's finger tests and finger tests she said she, she the opening was fine she said there's no closure there yeah, but does she push on the muscle to see whether it's no? Well, that's what you mean. Yeah, I'll ask her to do that then. So basically, is that that saying if you push on, the, if you palpate the muscle quite often, it will go. Yeah. Okay. So that's it's a why something warm relaxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could even ask. Do you know what you could ask for if they have it? You could ask for physiology. I'd like some an. I'd like some anal physiology, please, mm -hmm. to look at my face because that tests your sensation and your ability to relax and squeeze. Okay. Again, it's not perfect. You're lying on your side with some weirdo stood behind you, but it's, <laughs> it's an indicator of whether or not your muscle is spasming. Again, okay. I, you know, I can't give very explicit advice, but I no, would have a provision yeah. for anal physiology. Okay, that's brilliant. Thanks for that. Anytime. Right. Any more for any more before I leap in? No, they're all asleep. <laughs> okay i've got a few questions for you but okay. please 
Chris um, and Gary jump in if I'm talking too much. Hopefully these will be relevant for other people as well. So first of all, let's start with perspective. One of your early slides, Ellie, you said up to 25% of pouches suffer from leakage. Mm -hmm. So just for statistical minded people, that means that at least 75% don't suffer from leakage. Mm -hmm. I think that's an important point because we often get pre-pouchy people uh, looking at these uh, recordings. And I think it's very important to emphasize that um, the problems that um, Ellie's been addressing tonight don't occur in the majority of pouchies. It's true. I don't see the well patients. So you have to remember, mm. and I should have reiterated yeah. this at the beginning, I see the people with problems. So I don't see the people yeah. that don't have these problems. I don't get to talk to them. Um, so yeah. yes, that is absolutely a brilliant point, is that most people don't have this <coughs> level of dysfunction at all. But, it, but one must be informed and prepared that it is a possibility, but also that there's a lot we can do should it happen. Yeah, yeah really good. Um, so second one, um, I, 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 on the uh, J Pouch UK specific group, Facebook group, I often mention to people who are um, uh, struggling immediately post op, um, post connection uh, with leakage and seepage that they wear a pad. I've, mm. I've been I've been put off that tonight by your comments about pads. No, but in the there, early, no, in the early for... days, no. In the early yeah. days, you have yeah. to. Yeah. In the yeah. early days, you absolutely have to. But what I'm saying is if I've seen somebody, and mine tend to be long, longer term pouch patients, several months down the line who are having leakage, that if they've seen me for several sessions and they are we wearing a pad, I take that very badly because I think yeah. what more yeah. should I have done. Okay. It, but no, of course yeah. you've got to wear a pad when you just had one because you sen your sensory yeah. perception is all over the place and your pouch is new. So no, you must yeah. wear a pad, of course. It's more if they've had treatment and they no, tend to be longer term. That's good. Thank you. I'll continue to give that advice then. That's, that's good. good. No, um, good that's good. So uh, if, if I hold on to my uh, contents mm -hmm. uh, for a while, mm -hmm. um, it tends to kind of, upset the pouch a bit the pouch mm. misbehaves yeah grumbles doesn't like it and that continues for a while afterwards even after i've emptied is that a good thing you know you mentioned about um holding stuff in when you're at home you know just training the pouch to uh increase capacity is it a good no, thing not if it's if painful it really no it's your body's way of saying no way mate uh, this is highly yeah. irritant substance and I'm not, yeah. yeah, so yeah. no, it's not one size fits all. Everybody's completely individual and you can try it. And it's useful if you can do it um, for emergencies. It's useful if you can yeah. do it, if you have the ability, but if it hurts, no, you mustn't. No, of course not, not feasible. It yeah. is your body's way not, of saying, I'm upset with you. I'm upset yeah. with you, let it us down. It doesn't hurt, it just like grumbles a bit, you know, it's just, you know, it's there, you know, it's but, there. Uh, being able to do it is a is a massive gift being it yeah. being possible is a gift because that increases your confidence yeah um i i i ascribe an awful lot of pouchy stuff to peristalsis and the, mm, the vagaries is. of peristalsis in a small intestine that's been messed around and cut up and stitched together and uh, peristalsis, presumably in the pouch, is all over the place. It's whopping pressures, absolutely whopping pressures mm. in the small bowel. Mm. And it is, it is all over the place because it's anatomically different as well as physiologically and, yeah. you know, in terms of nerves. So, yes, it is, it's, it's huge. So would that explain um, the sensation of really needing to go and then the, yes uh, it dissipates you mentioned the word dissipation which i think all of a yeah. sudden you know two seconds later it's it's kind of gone but it's not because so it's contracting pronounced. and then relaxing it's, yeah 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 and yeah. Um, essentially all you've got between your pouch and the outside world is this so you know it's, yeah. a, it's a lot of it's a lot of back pressure when it contracts it's a lot of back pressure yeah does the pouch itself okay. actually do peristalsis Yes, of course it does. Yeah, it's alive, isn't it? So it all mm. moves. Mm. I, I think I think the peristalsis in the pouch is a really uh, ad hoc and 
um, individual thing because we're all different. Um, we may have Absolutely. similar similar sort of shapes, uh, but shape pouches, but the actual nerves and the peristalsis within each pouch is gonna be slightly different. And That's I think correct. when you get an alignment of the, the peristalsis, and the random peristalsis, when you get an alignment with the stuff that's in there, you tend to get good emptying, but most of the time it's sort of partial emptying because you don't get, and, and I, I, I often advocate to people that if they sit on the toilet for 15 minutes, chances are they'll get a really good emptying. And it, sometimes it can, you can get 10 minutes of nothing. And then all of a sudden, the Whoosh. planet's aligned. Mm. I know, I know. And that's for me. That's a really good emptying. So I, I sometimes say to people, just you know, get a good book and and give it a know, bit longer. Enjoy. Give it a bit yes. longer. Yeah, women are very bad at spending long enough on the loo. Men don't seem to have a problem, but women are dreadful. They just go in and then they're off the loo. Men are better in terms of the fact that I think they go in the toilet to avoid people, but women are <laughs> awful. They're ge no, women are awful because they're generally tr they're thinking about the next thing they have to. Women are appalling at emptying, whether they've got patch or not. They go in and then like, right, what have I got to do? And then you've got like, mom, mom. Then you're like, oh my god, what's for dinner? Whereas men are just like, I'm going here with my book, and I'll see you in 45 minutes, and I'm not going to think twice about that. Yeah, <laughs> it's a fundamental difference. So, <laughs> well, I'm going to come on to a controversial topic. Oh no, really? Okay. I was no, it's not myself. really controversial, but it's just it's just something I think which I see posted uh, a number of times, uh, uh -huh. questions about it and related to it. Over the years, do pouches become um, saggy, lose their tone? Um, is it is it, uh, it is it something which one can anticipate as one gets older, or as the pouch gets older, that one might lose tone in the in the pouch and also sorry just an extension of that question oh ellie are we all going to end up with bags one day no no you're not but i think pelvic law has lots to do with a one trick pony but i think actually when we age we lose fibrin and elastin off the pelvic floor and that's going to affect your functioning you know and mm. we all do and that's why exercises are for life not for christmas um in, I, I base it on my experience. I believe from my experience that they don't necessarily get floppy as in the same way that your bowel doesn't get floppy. That's an urban myth. Mm -hmm. I think essentially what happens yeah. is there's other changes, the concomitant factors, things like the muscles, the medications you take, um, you know, other diseases in your body. I think I'm, are a big factor in terms of pouch aging you you must ask uh, zara perry woodford though because she's going to have more experiential learning of that but i don't think it's because your bowel doesn't get floppy as you age and your small bowel doesn't get floppy as you age so i don't see why that there would be a direct correlation i i think it's more the concomitant factors the other things like your muscles and your sensory perception and the medications that you're on and the mm. other illnesses you have so for me personally no, I don't think you're all going to end up with a bag at all. That's a really good question, uh, Ben. Thank you for asking. Very good. I think, I think it, it, it. Sometimes we get um, you can get a bad press pouches just just by listening to very very well intentioned talks. Uh, um, I'm not I'm not talking about this one, but I think people the people who you hear about on Facebook etc have problems, and that's entirely appropriate for them to share them on a support group like. Uh, the J pouch group or indeed the red line group it's entirely appropriate totally and I wouldn't want anyone to feel that that was inappropriate but it does give you an impression that there's lots of problems associated with the pouch which statistically is not the case it's not no the case. You know, it, but you always hear the bad press don't you because everybody else is yeah. out at the pub aren't they yeah. so yeah. so that, I, I know I keep yeah. mentioning the pub but like yeah. this, I've got a problem with yeah. that. But essentially, um, yeah. you don't get good press. You don't get good press in, in anything, you know, in terms mm, of the fact right. that the people who aren't that's bothered right. by it aren't yeah. necessarily writing about they're their off. experiences. Yeah. They're, they're off. Yeah. They're out. Yeah. Yeah. So um, related to this topic, um, we had an eminent surgeon from St. Mark's uh, who... I think three or four years ago at the Information Day talked about um, 
um, problems with pouches as you get older. Actually, it wasn't the pouch that she was referring to. It was the anal sphincter. Mm -hmm. Miss Faisy. Uh, oh, no, no Sue Clark. Miss, Miss Sue, Clark, Sue Clark, yeah. I mean, Sue Clark does a lot of pouch problem surgery and pouch resection. She, so, she sees and, the bad cases. Yeah, yeah. She um, does. But she talked about the the tone of the, uh, the anal sphincter and that over time, as one gets older, um, the the tone will inevitably deteriorate. Not and, if you exercise um, it. That can, right, it's very important. She, she her, The analogy she used was, um, you don't see 80 year olds winning Olympic golds. But you see 80 year old bodybuilders, don't you? Yeah. And yeah. you do, if, if they're in their own category of other octogenarians. Oh, Chris Brown, Chris Brown's an eight. Yeah, Chris Brown, for one. So yeah, I, I would say I don't agree with that. I would say it's like any mm. other muscle in the body. Actually, deterioration is not inevitable. You can exercise. That's what I would say. Yeah. So exercise, the pelvic floor exercises, the and the sphincter out, exercises, that yeah. That's a really good sphincter exercises, all really good. Keep them up. Brilliant. Um, we've we've got a question here um, uh, from Ben. Ben's asking, where do you practice? Do you take private referrals? And do you have an email address available to make an appointment? So probably best not wanting to share the email address, but we, we're happy to receive and distribute if you're happy for us to do Yeah, things. absolutely, 100%. Anybody's got any, um, oh, thanks, Isabel. Pilates is great for pelvic floor. Um, yeah, very happy um, if group members want to contact me on my email. Uh, practice at the Princess Grace Hospital in Welbeck Street in London for outpatient appointments. Um, and yeah, email me any questions as well. Very happy for the group to have my email. That's fine. Disseminated from you, though. I'm not going to say it on here, just in case there's hackers. Yeah. Hackers, yeah. Yeah, uh, Gary's very good. Both hacking into the red line um, group, hackers. Uh, yeah. No, G Gary's really good at that. He's really, really good at that. Um, <laughs> Gary's a so the refer is the refer Will the referral be by a GP? No, just come from your surgeon or GP or yeah. you can, to be fair, you can self-refer, but I prefer for medical completeness to have a, a GP referral or a surgeon referral. But bear in mind that if your surgeon is anywhere around here, I know them because I've worked with them. I work mm. with the major mm. colorectal surgeons within London, have done for years. So most of them know what, know what I do. If, if people aren't located in, in London um, or in Oxford, I would imagine, mm. um, are there are there bi biofeedback centres around the UK? Yeah, there are. I mean, there's levels of it. You might see it called something else. It's kind of it's a bit uh, passe now. Biofeedback. It's called conservative bowel management. But um, most places, and major centres, so major hospitals, certainly teaching hospitals, will have a colorectal department which will have um, specialist nurses in biofeedback or pelvic yeah. floor or colorectal or whatever. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, it used to be like very very unusual to meet another one um, but people have it as part of their role now so it's more of a sort of hybrid role you're a colorectal nurse a stomach care nurse and a biofeedback nurse so yeah, i'm seeing it more and more i, I remember um, one of my friend one of my friends said to me would you say this was about 15 years ago would you say you were one of the top 10 biofeedback nurses in the country and i said well i think there's only about six in the country yeah <laughs> <laughs> so i'm, I'm definitely in the top ten. Definitely in the top ten, but yeah, I mean, people like me who have just, you know, done an awful lot um, of it and haven't had, I, I, I did it, nothing else, you know, for 13, 14 years. Um, I'm, sli I'm slightly less mm. of a one-trick pony now, but people like me who are dedicated specialists are rarer, um, but you don't really need somebody. Mm. You don't really, it's, it's a lot of it's common sense, as you will have noticed. I'm not a you know, I'm not a rocket scientist. This is common sense, and actually, the the salient bit of the my assessment and everything is actually just listening and going. We thought about trying this. You know, it's it's not difficult. It's having yeah, an external yeah. person to ask you explicit questions, extrapolate what the problems are, and fire back suggestions. That's all it is. Not rocket I, science. I, I I accept all that. Well, I I take I take your word for that. I don't believe it, but I think you have very specific and very excellent knowledge uh, certainly for pouch uh, pouch uh, 
people. And one of, one of the concerns that I hear time and time again that we hear in Red Line Group is that in, in the uh, outside of London and outside of Oxford, a lot of um, uh, people, a lot of medical people haven't, haven't heard of pouches. They don't know what they're dealing with. And that's a big, big challenge, I think. Yeah, yeah. GPs in particular, but also about secondary care centres. So that, that's an ongoing challenge, I think. Or patient support group such as red lion group to i think to, it's difficult but um, i think you you can tap into resources by remote everything's done on zoom yeah, yeah. so you can tap into a yeah. tertiary referral center and say to your gp please refer me to st mark's to speak to a pouch nurse yeah. you know because because you yeah. can access the tertiary referral center services without actually That's having to go right. all the way to london yeah yeah indeed right i've hogged 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 uh sorry chris sorry gary uh, anybody else? Last couple of questions uh, before we allow Ellie to escape. Uh, Thanks, Teresa. Yeah, definitely underestimating a skill set. Definitely. Any other questions for anyone? If not, then I'll wrap up. Ellie, is there an optimum? Oh. Is there an optimum amount of fluid that you should introduce to the into the pouch? for irrigation or it doesn't actually matter as long as you're not pushing too hard and fighting pressure and all those things you mentioned well, i'll be worried about several liters obviously but, um, <laughs> uh, but no not really because if you put too much okay. in it'll hurt it'll fill Fine. too it'll fill too full so no not really it'll, it's it'll yeah i've anyway. never heard of anybody yeah. perforating themselves or anything Fine. like that but uh, i mean obviously don't run in several liters because that's silly <laughs> what is <it>? okay <laughs> shall we um shall we let ellie um uh go to enjoy bed the rest yes. of the evening she's obviously going down the <laughs> pub um yeah listen, that's thank right you, I thank am. you so much uh on, on, i mean we've had a lot of comments uh, that you've seen on the chat here i think everyone who's attended tonight has got um a lot of, a lot out of your presentation ellie so once again on behalf of all of the uh, people who've, who've attended tonight and indeed everybody who's going to watch the video as well uh, download it on the video now thank you again for your fabulous uh, time and effort and energies and insights and expertise uh, they've been so entertaining and informative tonight and um, I, I'm sure I speak for everyone in saying it's a, another fantastic Ellie Bradshaw uh, evening and please come back again next year i will you know you know i, I keep coming back i haven't even worked yeah, so much we like don't, two we, years we don't i just won't leave wine now. no i yeah, know i get nothing but i don't care, care. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. i'm very thank happy i love you. to come and talk to Peggy. and thank you to gary for pressing all the right buttons and to oh Chris for gary presses all my uh, buttons again. <laughs> and and to you all Thank you all for attending. Thanks very much indeed. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks, Thanks very much, guys. Yeah. Anything Thank you need, you. let me know. Thanks for arranging. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, guys.